Well, I think Man United are the new Spurs. Desperate. I can't lie, seeing Spurs catch strays like this after winning 2-0 is crazy. Kino, there was no need for this. Over the years, I've grown to expect very little from Manchester United. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me ten more times, I think I need to visit a psychiatric ward. Another season has come by, and United have started off in abysmal fashion. The recent form has produced some bright moments from the men in red, but overall, it's left me with a sense of dread. And the disappointing behavior stretches far beyond just the pitch. And we can't blame Ronaldo anymore, unfortunately. So, what's the problem? Well, a lot of things. The players, some more than others. The manager, some dodgy decisions there. The ownership, wasn't there supposed to be some major takeover or something a while back? All share some blame. Rip, Man United are back. Let's talk about the Red Devils, I guess. Yo, what is going on guys? Hope you're all doing well. I'm Tinashe, welcome back to the channel. If you're a regular watcher of this channel, you'll know that I don't typically talk that much about Man United, especially when you consider the fact that I am a United fan and that putting United in the title is basically free clicks. And the reason for that is I get too emotional, but I'm gonna try to keep it calm and collected for this video. There is no passion, there is no vision, there is no- I was sick a couple of days ago, but I'm glad that this team waited for me to get better just in time for the annual Sad Man United fan video. Just like last season, right on schedule, it's come after game week two. We've lost to a strikerless, caneless Tottenham Hotspur and gotten an undeserved victory against a Wolf team that had their manager walk out on them three days before the start of the season. Also, they lost their captain too. I'm going to be speaking about both games in conjunction while I lay on the criticism, so I'm sorry if my thoughts seem a little bit scattered, but I'll try to keep it coherent. Manchester United has to be the easiest team to play against amongst the elite teams right now in the Premier League. Absolutely everything they do is predictable, both in attack and defense. It really is crazy. Teams will usually look to find weak links and areas in their opposition and then expose them there in order to create openings in the attack. But when it comes to United, they're weak in so many areas that it doesn't really matter sometimes particularly on the flanks. On the left side, we have Luke Shaw and Alejandro Garnacho, who are routinely out of position when it comes to defending counter-attacks. We saw it quite a bit last year, but Garnacho seems to struggle quite a bit to impact games when he starts. One of the best super subs United had in a very long time, probably the best we had last season for sure, don't get me wrong, but for the time being, Iraiti benefits more from observing the game off the pitch than using that knowledge against tired fullbacks. I was recently looking up the list of the top 10 questions that science still can't answer, and how Dejan Kulusevski was allowed this much space on United's left flank before Spurs scored their opening goal was very high up on the list. It's a mystery. It truly is. Anthony is the most predictable player on the pitch and really only has one move, cutting inside. Defenders are so privy to this that he sometimes even gets shown space on the outside. Whenever he uses that space, his right foot just isn't up to standard though. He was unlucky to hit the post against Spurs, played Rashford in for some decent chances, and does have a good finesse shot on him. He also sprints back on defense, showing that at the very least, he is accountable. But at the level that these guys are playing at, and for a hundred million pounds, that's, that's just not enough, right? I mean, I hate to be that guy to attach the fee to a player and then criticize them because of that. I, I try not to do that as much as possible, but it, it's been known for a very long time, but Aaron Wan-Bissaka is one of the weakest on the ball in the team, and it's quite concerning that whenever he receives the ball, you can see that that's a pressing trigger for a lot of teams. More often than not, he'll be easily forced into making a wayward pass down the flank, and when he isn't, Onana becomes his only outlet. He is probably the most athletic player on the team, and more often than not, that pace and athleticism gets him out of trouble. I thought he actually played pretty well against Spurs. It was against Wolves where all these shortcomings were on display. United just keep getting exposed whenever the ball goes out wide. The midfield gets pulled into all sorts of directions and it just doesn't seem like there's any structure there, in and out of possession. Casemiro no longer becomes a passing option and once he's out of position, when we eventually lose the ball, it's curtains. It 
Doesn't help that he also seems to have lost some vigor since the start of the campaign. James Madison was cooking him all day. Bruno Fernandez and Mason Mount are naturally both eights, so it shouldn't come as any surprise that they occupy the same spaces on the pitch. I get that Ten Hag is trying to convert him into more of a deeper, maybe box-to-box -box type player, but doesn't seem to be working so far. And in the Spurs game, all of this was somehow even worse as Casemiro was playing in those spaces too. This all resulted in both teams being able to cut through United like butter. There was a moment in the Wolves match where Mateus Cunha just walked on through the United defense like it was nothing. Brushes past Casemiro and Martinez and gets up to the final third before the chance eventually comes to nothing. They should have scored there, just like they should have scored on so many other occasions. Honestly, United should have been 2-0 down by half time. It's one of those times when a win really feels like a loss for me. Watching Spurs' second goal was like watching a YouTube video at 0.5 times speed. How the ball was allowed to trickle its way into the back of the net while six Man United players stood in the box and watched was actually quite impressive in a in a backwards way. I tweeted it during the match and I'll likely tweet it again. Does anyone actually still think that Marcus Rashford is a striker? He's just not, is he? We all know how good Marcus Rashford is. He's shown us that in the past, but when he's up top, all alone, the guy just seems kinda lost. His movements off the ball when his teammates have it are just far too inconsistent. There was a point against Spurs where he missed a sitter of a header Yep, he was eventually ruled to be off sides, but he really didn't need to be, especially when he had like a yard or two on the defender. I think a more spatially aware and natural striker would have seen that and held their run a bit better. Bruno's miss was far more guilt-edged in any case. The inconsistency and indecisiveness of the front three is so strange to watch on the break. None of them seem to know what to do or when to offload the ball. I really do wonder how this gets fixed. And Andre Onana. It's pretty good. On to the penalty decision, or rather, non-penalty decision. It was a penalty, right? If it isn't, then I think all of our understandings of what constitutes as a handball is completely off. Hand in an unnatural position, blocking a ball that was struck on target, easy decision right? Then again, I'm not gonna make too much of a fuss over this one. I'll just chalk it up to nature balancing itself out. That and the referees being unbelievably erratic. At the very least, this is a league-wide phenomena. Ten Hag's decision to play the same starting 11 for both games, just for the team to be exposed in the exact same way both times, is really quite something. He has a lot to answer for. Of course, a lot of credit has to be given to Spurs. They played a really good match. Saar and Basuma in particular really did well and made that midfield their own. James Madison is gonna be a really great player for them, I can already tell. And the long-awaited Hugo Lloris replacement, Guillermo Vicario, looks to be pretty good too. He had a few good saves, including a great acrobatic save against a Casemiro header that made me swear at my TV. So. Cheers for that, buddy. And Wolves looks pretty promising too. Maybe after that result, they can push on and- Oh. Oh. Never mind. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a couple panic buys by United over the next week or so. Don't get me wrong, I'm well aware that football is a fickle sport. So while I'm frustrated and every other United fan is frustrated too, Maybe we're overreacting. I thought United played quite well in the first half against Spurs too. Plus, they had an even worse start to last season. I'm sure we all remember Brighton, Brentford, and the Ronaldo situation. Yet, we finished in third. We're also yet to see Rasmus Hoyland in the squad. There are quite a few midfield combinations that haven't been tested out yet, and it usually takes a couple of games for every team to really get going and kind of understand the assignment of each season, so. We can only hope that things take a turn on the pitch. Off the pitch, the decision making appears to be in a bad state too. Mason Greenwood looks to be making a return, and from all that we've been seeing, the leaks from the United staff, the fact that so much regarding this has hit the news cycle in the past week, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that this decision was made by the board a very long time ago. They're just unsure of how to make it official with the least amount of blowback. Not guilty in the court of law, but the court of public opinion made its verdict a pretty long time ago. We all saw the pictures, we all heard the recordings. I'm not sure how anyone at this club thought it would be a good idea to even consider this, or think that it would be received well by you know, not only the United fan base, but just the football world in general. 
it's, it's kind of crazy. And as if the club didn't already have enough of a history of attackers being attackers on and off the pitch, Anthony is under investigation for his own domestic case. All of this is insane. The amount of negativity surrounding this club at the moment is kind of hard to comprehend. And of course, there is the widely reported imminent sale of the club. Nine months ago, we were led to believe that the Glazer ownership would be coming to an end. Nine months later, and all the news on that has gone cold. You see this right here? It's Man United's price chart on the New York Stock Exchange. This is the 22nd of November, 2022, the day that this potential sale was announced. Truly a happy moment in human history. Supporting this club is bad for my health, man. Every time I make one of these videos, I age a couple years and God takes whatever scraps are left of my hairline. I guess it's a good thing that I support the Sharks too. They never let me down either. And there we have it. Sorry for the mostly reaction type content over the past couple of weeks. Uh, the next video is going to be a very big video essay that I've been working on for a couple of weeks now. So very excited for that to come out. Should be later on this week. Um, so you can watch out for that. And uh, yeah. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about this abysmal team and this abysmal form. Uh, all the links are in the description for the socials. Feel free to follow those. That's all for me today. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you're having a great day. Cheers, and I'll catch you in the next one.